Our last speaker of this morning's session is Dr. Joseph Sheff, another leading expert in coronary artery imaging, and he's going to talk to us today about CT angiography and uh, uh, CADRANS. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Joe Schoep from the uh, Medical University of South Carolina, and thus I'm a local. Welcome to Charleston. I'm uh, sure you will enjoy our beautiful city. Uh, we have the largest uh, historic district uh, in North America. Uh, we have beautiful beaches and a lot to do, so enjoy. And if you like what you see, maybe if you want to come work with us. <laughs> Good, let's get started. So these are my disclosures. Uh, these are mainly the companies that uh, support our research here at MUSC. Coronary artery CTA is up, in the, up, uh, up and coming. Um, recently we had the uh, 2020, 2021 HA guidelines issued where coronary artery CTA uh, was awarded a, one, a class 1A recommendation. That's the best that, uh, that can be given out. And it knocked down nuclear scanning to a recommendation 1B. So that's remarkable. And the reason for that is that it has excellent spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, more importantly, excellent sensitivity and negative predictive value. <clears throat> that means if you say based on a normal or near normal coronary CTA that that patient does not have coronary artery stenosis, you have an almost 100% chance to be correct. And it's non-invasive, which makes it, makes it very attractive for primary coronary diagnostics. So that's why it has this uh, high class recommendation. So when we do, do, do that, let's look at that. Stable coronary artery disease, uh, you also use it, as you will see later, to look at the uh, pressure conditions in the coronary arteries. We use it for plaque imaging, which becomes more and more important. Stents and grafts, coronary anomalies, and uh, in the acute uh, setting uh, for suspected acute coronary syndromes in the ED. <clears throat> a typical example, 56-year-old male with the uh, usual risk factors here and chest pain. And this is the coronary CTA. These are curved multiple planar reformats of the right coronary artery, left anterior descending, and the circumflex coronary artery where the vessels are basically splayed out in their entire course. And what we see here is the uh, contrast-filled lumen of the LED. And you note that here's a calcification, like we saw in the previous talk. Uh, but this is something that could not be seen by a calcium score. So here is an accumulation of very low-density, non-calcified plaque that causes a, a stenosis in the LED. We uh, estimate that stenosis uh, at a moderate to severe degree, 70%. Interestingly, that patient also has a, a mass in the left atrial appendix here, uh, which suspiciously looks like a thrombus. Now, that patient has functional impairment based on that stenosis. This is a reconstruction of the uh, heart muscle during systole, and this one during diastole. And if you look closely, this uh, portion here of the uh, anteroceptal wall does not contract like the remainder of the myocardium. Basically stays the same thinness, if you will, uh, like during diastole. So this uh, part, part of the myocardium does not contribute to myocardial contraction. Also, if you look closely, you see some uh, slight hypoattenuation in the anterior wall of uh, the heart in this uh, short uh, axis view. And this is the calf that was eventually done. During the calf, this was upgraded to an 80% stenosis of the proximal left anterior descending coronary artery. So in summary, what we can see based on this case here, uh, a stenosis uh, that led to an infarct with wall motion abnormalities, which uh, in fact uh, caused conditions that are favorable for thrombus formation. And we see hyperperfusion of the, uh, uh, of the, epicard of the ep myocardium in the uh, affected wall in acute coronary syndrome. So the take home points is CTA can not only be reliable exclude CAD, but also very specifically detected in the acute chest pain setting. 
and we can look at secondary signs such as CT perfusion, wall motion abnormalities, and other things that help us in our diagnosis. Another case, stable coronary artery disease. The first one was uh, acute coronary syndrome. A stenosis that we estimated at uh, 50 to 70 percent in the left anterior descending coronary artery. So this is an equivocal lesion just by looking at the coronary artery, and that is a limitation that uh, coronary CTA shares with uh, invasive catheter angiography. Just by looking at the structure and the anatomy of a lesion, you do not know whether it's meaningful, whether it really affects blood flow to the myocardium. And guidelines say that only those lesions that are meaningful and restrict myocardial blood flow should be revascularized. So we want to know whether this is uh, hemodynamically effective. Um, and for that, we have a method called CT fractional flow reserve measurement, or CTFFR. That is based on the same principle, uh, like if you measure uh, airflow across an airplane wing or uh, a wind, ch wind channel for a car. It uh, basically estimates what happens proximal and distal to a stenosis uh, in terms of a pressure drop. In this case, a priori, this was a CATRAT3 lesion. What that means, we're going to see it in a moment. Uh, and we got that additional CTFFR uh, information, which uh, in this case was somewhere between uh, 0.76 and 0.79. Everything below 0.80 is considered pathological. But this here is still a gray zone where we allow for slight variations between invasive catheter uh, and the coronary CT angiogram. So this patient would not go straight to the cath lab. Uh, rather, that patient would be put on optimized me medical therapy for three months. And uh, when the uh, symptoms persist, then ICA would be indicated. But you see what this does. It much improves our specificity, uh, specificity for the detection of lesions that really mean something and should be revascularized. So we don't send patients to the cath lab simply because they have stenosis. We only send patients to the cath lab who need to be revascularization. And it's, that saves a lot of patients from the cath lab. So that's the principle that I just explained. Uh, computation of fluid dynamics, which is uh, typically performed in those uh, supercomputers. Plaque imaging is becoming more and more important. There's a, a litany of studies that show that plaque imaging is an uh, increasingly important marker uh, for cardiac risk. We have no comparable data, so what uh, Dr. Abara said is right. Uh, currently, coronary artery calcium scoring is the gold standard for risk prediction. But uh, in a few years, I believe that uh, the measurement of the entire coronary artery plaque volume, including the non-calcified component, is going to be much, much more powerful than a coronary artery calcium sc screening alone. So this is a, a standard resolution 0.6 millimeter non-calcified plaque that you see here with a remnant of uh, the lumen uh, right here. Or this is a different patient uh, where you see a calcified plaque in the LAD that obstructs a portion of uh, the lesion. Stent imaging is also something, something that is becoming more important just to see whether the uh, stent is patent or whether there is occlusion or intimal hyperplasia. Graft imaging is also important, also for uh, resurgery. Um, this is a venous graft here to the posterior descending coronary artery of the right coronary artery. This is a, an arterial graft to the circumflex coronary artery. You can tell that this is an arterial graft because it's smaller and has a lot of uh, surgery clips on the way. An artery has more side branches that need to be uh, uh, occluded. And this is a lima graft losing the uh, left internal mammary coronary artery going to the left anterior descending coronary artery. We can image coronary artery anomalies uh, in their origin, in their course, and in their importance, in, in their import. So you have a 17-year-old uh, female, which has a left main coronary artery that arises from the wrong coronary artery cusp, namely the right coronary artery cusp, and then takes a course between the pulmonary artery and the aortic outflow tract to the left side of the heart. 
So this is a course that we previously considered malignant. Now we just say it's an inter-arterial course. Uh, but it could be important because uh, this is between two high-pressure structures, so there's a chance that uh, it gets compressed during systole. This is just a 3D recon that uh, shows you the course of uh, that vessel right here. So how do we select our patients and prepare them for the scan? The uh, uh, typical notion is that we uh, use pretest probability, and in the past, uh, low to intermediate risk for obstructive uh, CAD was recommended. Now that is changing. Increasingly, we are uh, now also imaging high-risk patients. There are some relative uh, and uh, more, more important uh, uh, contraindications. Non-compliance, for instance, is uh, obviously a firm con uh, contraindication. Unstable clinical status, the same. Renal insufficiency, arrhythmia, and high heart rates uh, are not that much of a problem. The latter two we can tackle with uh, our uh, enhanced equipment that we have. We still give, like to give our patients nitroglycerin that widens the coronary artery, and we can see them better. And we give them beta blockers to, if the heart rate is too fast. It's, uh, even with the most advanced scanners, image quality is better with slower heart rates. How do we interpret it? We do the coronary artery calcium score, and then we evaluate the coronary arteries for their anatomy, uh, for their dominance. Uh, we judge image quality, presence of calcifications, uh, and artifacts. Then we uh, look for plaques, as you saw. We grade coronary artery stenosis. We can evaluate stents and grafts. And we can obviously evaluate all cardiac structures that are there, the ventricles, the atria, the valves, pericardium, aorta, et cetera, et cetera, including devices. And we determine the cat rat's grade. So what is cat rats? Cat rats is a classification system for coronary artery disease. The first version was mainly aimed at coronary artery stenosis. And it's meant to uh, kind of condense our opinion of the uh, severity of a stenosis and what, tr what should happen with that patient into a single number. That's the uh, point of that classification system. Now, our ED jocks love that because it gives them a, like a single number that they can base their decision on in terms of patient management. Our cardiologists hate it because they don't like being told what to do and uh, anything in between. So this is the uh, classification. We have cat rat 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and N. 0 means there is not even calcium. So this is a documented absence of coronary artery disease. Cat rats of 1 is that there is some atherosclerosis, but uh, certainly no stenosis. Cat rats 2 is a, a mild uh, non-obstructive stenosis. Cat rat 3 is uh, equivocal, a moderate stenosis, as you've seen. And cat rat 4 is a severe stenosis. Cat rat 5 is a complete occlusion. And cat rat N means uh, the image quality is not uh, good enough for a cat rat's classification. It becomes interesting in the cat rat 3 classification, because like the case that you saw, that's where we're seeking additional functional assessment. In the past, that was typically a nuclear study, but we're using a CT FFR more and more. And the rest obviously goes the usual pathway of interventional treatment. Now, this is the uh, uh, version two of the uh, cat rats classification. And uh, here we're um, actually adding a lot more uh, in terms of the status of coronary artery disease uh, above and beyond the stenosis grade. So we add uh, risk factors, uh, we add, uh, add uh, 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 non-calcified plaque and other things that are modifiers to the original cat rats classification. So we learn a lot more uh, and we uh, capture a lot more about coronary artery disease uh, I'm not so sh absolutely sure that our ED people will be happy because uh, this will complicate their life if they don't get a single number, but uh, uh, are confronted with all sorts of modifiers. But uh, as I said, like uh, 
we learn a lot more about high-risk features uh, with the cat rats uh, 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 two classification. And uh, if you go to the uh, app store on your smartphones, uh, you can download the calculator for the version two uh, cat rats classification, which I would recommend because it uh, would be uh, fairly challenging to do that by hand. Here are high risk features that are captured by the uh, cat rats classification. Low attenuation of a plaque uh, indicates vulnerability. Spotty calcifications is uh, another sign of vulnerability. And we have positive vascular remodeling where the vessel uh, desperately tries to stay patent despite the presence of the atherosclerotic insult. Now, how can we do better? <clears throat> we can use ultra high resolution uh, CT with uh, more modern scanners. Like here we have a calcified lesion in the LED uh, where we don't really know how much of the, the lumen is affected simply because calcium always looks bigger in a CT image than it's in real life. So this would result in a cat rats three classification. This is the high resolution reconstruction. We see all, all of a sudden see a lot more of the non-calcified plaque burden and get a better idea of the patent lumen, which downgrades that patient to a cat rats two classification which means that uh, in this case, we would have recommended functional testing. In this case, no further testing is necessary, good for the patient and the healthcare system. So what's coming next? You've seen that plaque before, that non calcified uh, lesion here, but uh, with ultra high, high resolution, we see it much better over here with a 0.2 millimeter rec reconstruction as compared to a 0.6 millimeter reconstruction. Same is true for this plaque that you saw before. Here we are a little bit unsure um, what that means, but here we have a crystal clear image of that calcified component, a little bit of a non-calcified component, uh, which gives us a much better idea of the remaining lumen. Stent imaging also will greatly benefit from a high resolution CT, simply because uh, the artifacts are reduced and you get a better impression of what's going on within the stent lumen. And then we can do other things. Uh, we have uh, spectral capabilities on, for instance, photon counting CT, which allows us uh, to use those spectral capabilities to remove calcium from the CT image. And if you do that, and uh, if it's digitally subtracted, you get a much better idea of the remaining lumen and uh, of the uh, remaining plaque that is here. So I think these are things that uh, will make our life a whole lot easier in the future. So CTA is uh, number, the number one modality now for uh, imaging in uh, suspected coronary artery disease, and it's becoming a more and more important first-line test. We've discussed the changes in cataracts one versus cataracts two, and uh, we saw that we have improved reporting with that newer version, although more complex, and we saw improvements that can be incurred with new CT imaging techniques. And with that, I thank you, and uh, have fun out there. Enjoy Charleston.